I'm Veronica Carey, the Assistant Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And allow me to share my thoughts. Um, today, we are no longer silent. We are having the conversation. And mine is entitled, Please, I Can't Breathe. Uh, African Americans in the US are in pain. Our Drexel community includes African Americans, persons who identify as African American and Black. Hence, our Drexel community of African American faculty, professional staff, and students are in pain. I'm in pain. What are we looking for? A show of humanity, efforts to mobilize CNHP, and due to limited access to our, our usual social support networks, an opportunity for coping facilitated by bridging of these gaps. Quote unquote, I can't breathe. This is paramount when a lay person or a clinical practitioner hears these words. Someone is in distress. Our nursing students are taught to jump to their feet and assess steps one and two of the ABCs airway, breathing, circulation. This comes before any other concerns. It is a gasp and an utterance sending chills down your spine. These three words were chosen specifically because there was only enough air left in the lungs of George Floyd and he chose his words carefully. We should all reach for the oxygen. We should all reach for the defibrillator. We should all assist each other. Why? Because justice must be a verb. I cannot allow our conversation to erase. We are addressing racial institutionalized violence. George Floyd was murdered. Breonna Taylor and Aubrey, Aub Ahmaud Aubrey were murdered along with countless others. It, it's not falling on deaf ears or eyes. That commencement is in two weeks. We hope this forum demonstrates support to our seniors, reducing feelings of helplessness, impotence, and despair. I want all students to hear from department representatives to build the sense of community and to begin the necessary conversations in the course room. All viewpoints of panelists will be in their authentic selves as they share. So let's begin. Dr. Adenarin, could you please share? Absolutely. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Rita K. Adenarin. I am an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Advanced Rural Department of Dresden College of Nursing and Health Professions. I cannot believe, yet again, another bottomless act of violence by police officers. Many of us have witnessed on camera the cruelty that ended the physical life of Mr. Floyd. Ouch, it hurts. It has unleashed a myriad of emotions for me. I am appalled and terrified. I hope the visual and the visceral response from watching him die the way he did, we compel each one of us to engage in self-reflection and commit ourselves to be part of the solution. As an American born in Nigeria, I still struggle to understand why race is such a strong driver of hatred. Why? I did not realize that I am black until I arrived in the US. Nor does the Norwegian farmer know he is white when he is in Norway. However, after arriving in the United States, the Norwegian farmer quickly claims to be white because the unearned entitlement that whiteness affords him. Why I am fortunate and relatively successful in our country, I have not been exempted from the negative experiences related to my race and accent, qualities that I cannot change, but stands as indelible marks of stigma and sometimes subhumanity. And yes, I love America. I know my personal story is only possible in this country. 
I believe in the greatness of America and we have better days ahead. Allow me to share my experience. Not too long ago, I took my five children that I batted in America to, in, to a store in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. And a white female called the cashier, a, a white female cashier called the police on me because she does not believe I should be able to afford what I was about to purchase. When the officers arrived, the cashier, the cashier pointed me out and the first officer grabbed me in front of my children. Hax, <laughs> how did I get the credit card? I told him, I am a healthcare provider and I am an administrator, please. <laughs> oh, thank God, there was another officer that day. I am still alive. The cashier later explained that she thought I was a welfare mom and wanted to prevent fraud before it happens. This is in front of my five children. The store manager and the police officer apologized profusely after they learned what happened. Yes, they apologized, but I carry the invisible scar of that experience. Incidents of police brutality, brutality often open the wounds from this particular experience, including the horrific happening surrounding the death of Mr. Floyd. If you are privileged, why it is not your fault to benefit from unearned entitlements, do not take it for granted. I only ask you to not allow the luxury of obliviousness to blind you from the glaring evidence of injustice and unfairness that are occurring every day where we live, work, and play. Policing or police brutality should not be the only focus. Acts of injustice, unfair treatment happen in our learning spaces by how we conduct classes and interact with students, how we hire, fire, promote, follow, or lay off employees. Also, how we systematically and strategically structure opportunities. Each one of us, more so as member of the Dresden community, has a duty in making change happen. Speaking from my experience as an alum of Drexel University and a proud dragon, I know we have taken giant strides on the journey towards equality. However, there's still a long way to contribute and help bring out the best of America. I hope that everyone feels the pain caused by the atrocities of police brutality and the smaller acts of unfairness that happen outside policing. Sometimes these inequalities of people because of variables of diversity are normalized in ways that we no longer see it as bad. Perhaps the unfair treatment of the order, whatever the order may be, will be more glaring if each one of us authentically empathize and make it personal. For example, let each one of us replace Mr. Floyd with someone we truly love in our life and reflect on how you will feel if that happens to that person. We are at crossroads in our country and we must take action to accelerate enduring change for a better country from our advantage, from our vantage point as students, staff, faculty, and all administrators. Thank you for listening. And I'll pass it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ballinger, would you care to share, please? I'm Jess Ballinger, uh, Health Administration Department. I teach courses in bioethics and the history of healthcare. As a historian, it's my obligation to introduce my students to some of the darkest, most depressing episodes in the human experience. Regarding race, I ask them to look long and hard at the horrifying history of unethical research on African Americans, at how, in so many ways, modern medicine has been built on the brutal exploitation of black and brown bodies how the context of slavery, segregation, white supremacy, and racial violence have historically been reproduced in healthcare. 
and how the historical weight of all these things is compounded into the present to produce gaping disparities in health and healthcare. What I worry about the most as I lead students, students through this is that it can be demoralizing. These are shocking and horrifying things to contemplate. I think it's crucial to teach these things, but I worry that I'm only deepening the pessimism about social change that they come into class with. And that's just not just a hunch or a feeling I have, by the way. I do polling uh, with my students at the start of almost all my classes, so I actually have a lot of data on um, pessimism that they have about social change. But I'm concerned because I think the biggest barrier to justice uh, is the widespread belief that these things are immutable, the product of human nature, human greed, and corruption that can never really change. As an antidote, I also do try to teach my students about the legacy of political activism in healthcare, about healthcare practitioners who have seen the political struggle for justice as central to their practice, and political movements that are oriented around the struggle of improving health and healthcare. I also think this is something we should talk about more as healthcare professionals. There are clear political and policy implications that flow directly from the social determinants of health. So maybe we ought to talk about them more as the political determinants of health and look at the ways we can join the political struggle for justice, not just as private individuals, but with the full social authority and power that we enjoy as professionals and members of powerful institutions like this university. Now, that's pretty much been my normal teaching challenge for a long time now. But this moment, this moment is one of those rare times uh, where the present is actually outdoing the past. And I've been worried, I've been scared. And when I think about all uh, what's going on right now and what I've said doesn't even begin to describe, I think the magnitude and complexity of what we're facing, shall we add, uh, for instance, climate change to our discussion and talk about how uh, race uh, and health are entangled with that. I can't tell my students or my children, uh, who as it happens are about the age of most of the students I teach, I can't tell them that everything is gonna be okay. And that's hard for me, especially given what I teach, that is hard for me. But even if I can't be optimistic, I do still have hope. I don't know how many students, how my students are dealing with this uh, right now. Uh, over the last few days of the term, I'm going to try and find that out. But I can imagine, I can hope that this massive upsurge of protest at racial injustice, this massive demand for change that they're seeing and that maybe some of them are even uh, participating in is actually giving them some grounds for encouragement, for hope. So let me end uh, with a quote by Vaclav Havel that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. I don't know where all of this is gonna end up, but I do know that what we're trying to do here today makes sense. And I thank Dr. Carey for bringing us uh, together. Thank you so much, Dr. Ballinger. Professor Gonzalez, would you like to continue? Sure, thanks. Hi, I'm Maureen Gonzalez. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the undergraduate nursing program and a four-year member of the Board of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I'm here today, like my colleagues, because I'm sad and angry and want to be part of the solution and not the problem. We in the undergraduate nursing program have always put forth the mission of inclusivity um, in our classrooms as a major priority. And we include disparities in healthcare for racial minorities as an objective in every course that we teach. I've been lucky to be the chair of reproductive health um, in the undergraduate program. And I have emphasized and included the high rate of more maternal morbidity um, for women in childbirth of African American race. In this country, uh, in this country, and as a prime concept of both what we lecture about and what our dialogues in the classroom are about. We as nurses take an oath that requires us to do the right thing and do no harm. And for that reason, we have to speak up against what is going on and the present day racism. We are at a critical place in dealing with this long-standing racism in this country. And I want to be part of what we want the future to look like, both here at Drexel in our community and abroad. I'm here so that you know that nursing is reflecting and acting on this. 
and we will move forward from here so that the Drexel community is a safe and inclusive place for you, all of your students to live and learn and all of my colleagues to work and practice. I'm truly humbled to be here. I don't feel like I should be sitting here and, um, and I hope I don't say the wrong thing today, but I want to be part of the solution and this is important for me as a professor, as a nurse, as a nurse practitioner and as a mom in this community. So I'm humbled to be here. Thank you, Dr. Carey for including me and I look forward to furthering this discussion. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Gonzalez. Dr. Jordal, would you like to share? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Christian Jordal. I'm an associate clinical professor and the interim department chair of the Counseling and Family Therapy Department. I just want to acknowledge the significant pain and trauma um, that the killings of the persons that Dr. Carey had mentioned earlier um, are just something that's impacting every uh, person but especially uh, black individuals and persons of color. Um, I think that I've been thinking a lot about recently as a white person, notably as a white male, you know, uh, how I'm feeling. I'm aware of my anger, but I think I'm also tuning in more to the shame underneath that that's frequently there. And I think that's associated with governments and institutions, their policies, procedures that continue to render uh, people, notably black people, invisible. Um, I also think that I um, believe that the journey to becoming aware of one's privilege, notably one's white privilege, is something that you spend a lifetime doing. It's work every day. And I th that is the work that the faculty and professional staff and the students of my department do. And the idea is that, um, to me, um, one of the things that I think a lot about as a white male is that awareness is not action. And action... Um, you know, needs to occur in advance of any of my colleagues or students of color, because that's the work of restorative justice. And that's moving from, you know, to me, cultural competency um, to being an anti-racist, to anti-racist practices. Um, we were asked to talk about how we think this impacts our student body. I think that one of the things that I've been more aware of this week, particularly, is how the policies and procedures oftentimes at Drexel and at other institutions that are designed to keep students safe, to empower students, also tend to skew towards being punitive towards racial minority students, notably black and brown students, during disruptive events. These are students oftentimes that are coming back at a, at a later in life. These are students who are working concurrent to being in school. They're managing multi-generational family, families, children, you know, and I wonder a, a lot about how it is that disruptive events ultimately impact not just the students, but their educational outcomes and their trajectories and how the policies reinforce that. I think that when I think about sort of the other question we were asked to answer, which is this idea of how it is that the current atrocities sort of impact healthcare, um, I'm fortunate to be involved with my disciplinary accreditation board as well as my state licensing board. And so when I think about university and program accreditation and license specific or certification specific requirements, they always stress cultural competency, especially in outcome based frameworks. But I think that competency is so often narrowed as inclusion or awareness, and it does not include anti racist education. And I think that awareness without education specific to social location, to power, to privilege, that only reinforces top-down healthcare delivery, and it only reinforces adverse health outcomes among uh, black and brown people. And so I, I, one of the things I would put out there, I think we're thinking about in our department is how it is that we build programs that sort of ultimately attracts students? How is it that we have policies that are inclusive, but more to the point, restorative? And how do all our programs embed within them curricula that specifically speaks to anti-racist education? So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Richard, Tina, would you like to share next? I would like to share a little story, if I may, that I think that would uh, encompass everything that we're talking about right now. And uh, everyone, this, I'm Rich Pepino, uh, Food and Hospitality Management. And uh, I'd like to start off with a small quote. A life is not important 
except in the impact it has on other lives. These words were spoken by my childhood hero, Jackie Robinson. Um, as a child, you choose who to look up to and who you would admire and respect. And so having a wonderful family myself, I also am going to speak about my grandparents, especially my grandfather. My grandfather, Frank, he was a first generation son of a poor immigrant family who arrived here from Italy just after World War I. Um, thinking back to stories that he would tell uh, about my family and always how everyone would eat together and they would share a lot of practices together, but a lot of things came back to our family at the table. Now, depending on upon money at that time, you could say maybe they had the money to buy cheese, maybe they had the money to buy meat. But one thing, uh, they were always very involved in um, those values that were shared at the table. And now, as I look into the future and see where we're at today with society, I observe families that are raising children in what we call today food swamps and the swamp culture. As a result of this, we are not only affecting the nutrition of our children, we are starting to lose the values that come with eating together as a family. And in full, I, I view myself looking back at even with my grandparents and getting that happy meal box if you go to McDonald's. And now I ask myself, how happy truly am I if I do that with my own children? It's a question I ask. And then also looking back at my grandparents, I think back to Frank and as much of a good man as I saw and I observed, when I was younger, I also now realized that his opinion of race was much more narrow-minded. And that came with maybe the day and age that he was being raised. But as Frank grew older, Frank changed. And I saw my grandfather change in front of my very eyes. So much that by 2008, my grandfather not only voted for Barack Obama, which as a child, I never would have imagined, but he actually proudly put his bumper sticker on his car. Barack Obama said that change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones that have been waiting for it and we are the change that we seek. But then for my grandfather, Frank, Frank, Barack Obama became the change that he saw. He no longer saw the color of his skin as an impediment, but rather he saw a person that he shared core values with, who stood there with integrity, and would provide leadership. So Frank will always be my hero because as Jackie Robinson felt, good people impact other lives. And Frank left an indelible mark on my life character. I just hope I get to live up to his expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that immensely. Michelle Radigan. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Radigan. I teach in the Department of Creative Arts Therapies, specifically in the Art Therapy and Counseling Department uh, program. I'd like to acknowledge I'm white, cisgendered female, and I am speaking to you from the traditional land of the Lenin Lenape. Oppressive systems cannot be dismantled with individual subtle shifts. If you haven't noticed, there's an earthquake and a justifiable global uprising going on right now that demands and deserves bigger action and tangible collective responses. The change needs to start with clinical education. As health professions educators, we recognize that the insidious effects of institutional racism, recent effects of COVID-19, senseless killings of innocent black folks, and centuries of marginalization and oppression on our student body have been wearying, especially for black, indigenous, and persons of color students. As with other professions, the creative arts therapies are not immune to the dominance of white Eurocentric literature and microaggressions from faculty and clinical supervisors that perpetuates it. We need to widen the range of resources and information and education that have historically mainly benefited people who are white. We need to work harder to include and highlight and lift up the experiences and needs of people of color. 
To diversify education means to better education. To better education means to better the care we offer to clients because the care needs bettering, especially in behavioral health care. We need to better prepare Creative Arts Therapies graduates to move into the field ready to not only provide excellent care grounded in cultural humility, but to contribute to the transformation for institutional change, to advocate, to disrupt, to dismantle oppressive systems. There is no doubt racialized institutional violence negatively impacts health, healthcare quality, and healthcare access. But again, the change needs to start with our clinical education. The Creative Arts Therapies Department recognizes we all need to do better. So I stand here and represent my department today to say that we are here to continue to listen and to learn and to hold ourselves accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Vatican. Now we'll hear from Professor Snyder. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Megan Schneider. I'm assistant professor in the physician assistant program, and I'm a member of the board of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I focused my comments today on how our department in particular has responded and how I hope we may be reshaped in the future. So um, to start with our response, um, our program director, uh, Julie Kinzel, um, has sent a message to all of our students acknowledging the fear, anxiety, and grief of recent events. And I personally want to recognize that while the fear, anxiety, and grief may feel like a shock to our white students in particular, for our students of color, it may be both traumatizing, but it also may feel like nothing new. In the message, students were advised to respond in professional and nonviolent ways and to, quote, uh, continue our education towards ending systemic racism, healthcare disparities, and violence against people of color in this country, end quote. Students were encouraged to reach out to their faculty advisors or to the Counseling Center for Support, and several students have reached out expressing appreciation for this message. I personally feel like we are not doing enough to prepare our students to think critically about race and how it impacts their future patients' lives and health. Um, we're not currently preparing our students to have these discussions either with each other or with their patients. And as a largely white profession, to get the best patient outcomes, I think that we really need to diversify the profession, diversify the PA faculty, and also prepare white PAs to serve patient of patients of color the best that they can. To do this, uh, we need to focus on uh, recruitment and retention efforts uh, for, of students of color. I think we need to embed anti-racist education into our curriculum and to have real actionable items that are designed to create change within our department and within CNHP. Um, and I'd be happy to share some ideas that I have on how we might be able to achieve this, but I can do that at a later time. It is the, in the mission statement of the Physician Assistant Program that we train PAs to work with underserved populations. Um, and I think that we can do more to train our students to be advocates and allies. Um, and so I hope that these conversations that we're starting now um, really leads to, um, to our department and CNHP as a whole, seeing real change that translates into um, real change for our students and real change for our students' future patients. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to, um, to share. Thank you very much, Professor Snyder. I appreciate that. Dr. Volpe, would you like to share as well? Thanks, Dr. Carey. My name is Dr. Stella Volpe, and I am professor and chair of the Department of Nutrition Sciences, and I apologize that I'm already starting 
crying because Rita, every story has got me. But when I heard that, my heart just broke because I have no idea as a white person what it would be like. But I do remember a story. So I come to you representing the Department of Nutrition Sciences, but Dr. Carey gave us openness to share how we wanted to share, and I appreciate that. When I first started as a young assistant professor a long time ago um, at the University of Massachusetts, I'll never forget a good friend of mine named Dean said to me, you know, Stella, sometimes I just get pulled over by the police. And I looked at him and I said, well, like, were you speeding? Or, and he said, no, Stella, it's because I'm black. And it was at that time that I thought, oh my gosh. And he was a political science professor, so it was even better for me to learn so much from him on so many levels. And I still have so much to learn. But it was that moment in my life that I realized, my goodness, I've never had to worry about that. I've never had to worry about thinking, well, the color of my skin might affect how others treat me. I'm sorry, Dr. Carey, I'm trying to keep myself. You're perfectly fine. So I, I want to tell you something that I thought was very interesting. I really like listening to Trevor Noah. And I'm going to steal some things from him that he said the other day that really touched me. He talked about how dominoes connect, and all of us know that, and how that creates a giant wave. And that even those stories, all of us know, and I really am a firm believer of this, even though Trevor did say this, is that everything we do connects. And that connects as a, as a global society within just Drexel, within what we all do as people. And he brought up the legitim a legitimacy quote the, the principles of legitimacy that were written by Malcolm Gladwell in his book, David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. And there are three principles that Malcolm Gladwell bring up. He says, first of all, the people are asked to obey authority, have to feel like they have a voice, that if they speak up, they will be heard. Secondly, the law has to be predictable. There has to be a reasonable expectation that the rules tomorrow are going to be roughly the same rules as today. And finally, the authority has to be fair. It can't treat one group differently than another. And when Trevor Noah brought this quote up from Malcolm Gladwell, I thought, gosh, when I was asked to be on this, this panel, and, and certainly I also feel humbled, that that really resonated with me. It brought back my story to that way back when, when I was a young professor at UMass with Dean. And, and it also reminded me, because this might sound trite, but it really is one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King when he said, he hopes that his children can be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And I really, that's a quote that honestly, my whole life I've really enjoyed and, and listened to and try very hard to think, okay, that is really what help, you know, we all need to be judged by the content of our character and especially those who are black. So I truly thank you for this opportunity. I apologize um, for not holding myself so well. That is my uh, emotional Italian, as I say, but I can't help myself at times because this has really hit me very hard and, and I feel, I can't, I don't, words cannot express what I feel for the black community. So thank you, Veronica. Dr. Carey, thank you for this opportunity. Yes, thank you, Dr. Volpe. Um, and Sarah, Sarah, I believe that you are aware that you're next, but I'm gonna move Chuck in before we lose him on the, on the phone, if that's okay. Thank you. Chuck, would you like to share? Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well, wow. Um, my colleagues are sure something to follow. Um, and um, I will work hard not to repeat anything that you've already heard, but my name is Chuck Zaccardi. I'm a chef um, and a food grower um, and teacher of growing food. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an assistant clinical professor in the uh, food and hospitality management department. 
Um, I just want to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a privileged white man in America and I have no, I have, I have a pro I don't have a problem admitting that I have a problem with that. And, um, I'm also racist and I'm not saying that because I'm on a clear line of racism that's recognizable. Um, I've had many black friends in high school and, and one of the stories that sticks out is that I was walking side by side with one of my great friends in my neighborhood, which is largely a white neighborhood in Wynwood. And a police officer drove by and he slowed down and eyeballed my friend. I was completely oblivious to that. And he said, did you see that? And I said, see what? I'm just kind of walking with my friend. He's like, that cop. He was a white cop, and he eyeballed me. He's, he's like, get, he's like, what are you doing here, kind of thing. And I was, I'm like, really? I kind of discounted it. I'm like, did, did you really? That happened? That didn't happen, really? He's like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And that's the first time that I really saw the line, and I was like, wow, I was, I was just happy to, you know, have friends that were cool and fun and didn't have inhibitions and kind of were, you know, were, were just very enjoyable to be around. And whether they were black or white or whatever color they were, didn't matter to me. But as I grew up, I learned that, you know, that it mattered in this country and um, particularly was noticeable to them. And it didn't matter whether I didn't notice or not, it was still there. Um, so this, so I had very frank conversations with my black friends in, in school and, and they taught me a lot. They really opened my eyes to how they had to live and, you know, and they did not live every day angry about it. They did not live every day angry at me. Although in a lot of ways I felt that they should have been, um, you know, and, I don't know. I I look at the the line of racism of you know is it, it, there is a black and white necessarily to it, no pun intended, but it is also skewed. It it is very vague because by the by the point of me just not even recognizing it and not even being aware of it, and then you know being aware and denouncing it and doing everything possible to stop it from happening and being anti-racist to every every person that I see the fact that I wasn't doing that you know now I realize that put me into that category and it makes me feel very bad now and even as an adult and in hospitality because inherently we are hospitable we care about people's feelings and serving people and and the idea is it's whoever the people are you know they all deserve service and they deserve kindness but at the same time it my ability to really take it to the next step in actually taking my humility which i have taking my empathy which i have and actually doing something with it it's not enough to have it and it's not enough to feel bad and feel sickened by, I really, right now I feel sick that I'm a white man privileged in America. It makes me ill. Um, and my family feels my wife has no problem admitting that also for me. Um, and, you know, my family, we talk about this. And it's, it's, it's difficult to look at what I haven't done in the past. And, you know, the writing has already been on the wall. We've already gone through this. There's already been in recent times and, and in, in, uh, in history plenty of atrocities against black people by, um, by law enforcement and others in it and, and the general white public. It's already been there. So, you know, I, I ask myself, why the heck did it take now to all of a sudden – be completely sickened by it. But that kind of, that feeling gives me a platform. And, you know, rather than paralyzing me, I'm using this to lift myself up. And it's not about me. You know, this, of course, is not about me. But at the same time, 
the solution is about me because it's it's right there for me requiring me to do something about it and that is my full intention is to do everything possible about it and it's not just in my mind it's with my students and i have the fortune of of teaching many students throughout of many majors in the university on top of my hospitality students uh, and culinary arts students. Um, so I really have, you know, we have this integration into my classes, which is to be celebrated. And I, and I do, and I keep it, keep conversation open and, and inclusive and such. And it's, it's always positive. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not something that every day and, and every night that it weighs on people's head, but it absolutely weighs on um, on the African American community, even though it's not right there in front of us. They're not, you know, you know, the students in my class and the people in my life aren't always saying something. It's not always. It's not a convert. It's not a, a subject of conversation constantly, but it's there. And now we really, really see that it's there. I mean, negativity has has gotten uh, momentum in this country. And what also has get some momentum is positivity. And that's in a good direction. Drexel has been pretty good at squashing any momentum of negativity. When an incident occurs, they squash it. That has been very good. But squashing the momentum now is no longer enough. You can't just squash momentum and then leave it there because that's actually not progress. I am looking forward to now, even though it's late, but it's not too late, to be very much part of this progress. And there's a professor, a doctor, Arthur Shostak, when I was in graduate school at Drexel, um, he wrote a book called Viable Utopian Ideas. He was a futurist. And I really loved talking to him because he was, you know, he was all about his idea of the future and, and these viable utopian ideas, these beautiful things that actually can occur and then how to make them occur. Well, that's where we are now, this total inclusive, this total diversity and this total respect and, and empathy for one another as a whole, particularly the black community, the white community with the black community and everyone. That's something that can happen. Now what we need to do moving forward is have these very specific action steps on how to do that. And the white community needs to be more so a part of that. It's not just enough to say, you know, I, I'm good with it all. That's not enough. You actually have to be part of the forward momentum in actually making it good. Absolutely. So in Absolutely. the end of that, yes, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just asking you to kind of, um, you know, wrap up your last comments, please. Yeah, so we have, to, we have to ask ourselves questions. And then on top of that, we have to answer those questions. And I'm really looking forward to being part of the positive answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining so remotely. I know there was a process with well, the storms and everything, you and, and Professor yeah. some issues. So I'm glad that you were able to attend. Um, Dr. Thank Wendt you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm from the Department of Rehab, of PD and Rehab Sciences, and I also work at 11th Street. So I want to speak from both of my roles, and I'm going to start with 11th Street because part of what we're talking about is the intersection of racism and health, and that is something we've been doing at 11th Street for such a long time. And uh, of course, the re recent, event, recent events have had their impact, but this is something longstanding for 400 years and something we are trying to tackle in this space and time. You know, we weren't here for the beginning of it and I would love to think that we would be here for the end of it, but realistically, that's probably not likely. So it's really about doing our part in this moment. Um, I, I uh, certainly see the impact of racism on health every day I'm at 11th Street and I could talk for four hours of different stories to exemplify that, but I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so I will say there are a couple things that we do at 11th Street. We've had an undoing racism group among the staff for a long time. 
that unfortunately I have not been able to participate in because I'm teaching on those days. But we've recently started an anti-racism group that's a combination of staff and um, community members. And I do sit on that group and it has been such an incredible honor to be in that group and such, um, such a grounding experience to be there during these times and to feel like there's something that I can do and participate in. Um, so I, I encourage all of you to check out 11th Street and really look at the work we're doing over there. I, it's the most wonderful place I have ever provided healthcare. I feel more enabled to provide good healthcare there than I have ever felt anywhere working in my career prior. Um, I wanna say a little bit about me because I, um, I do, people do not always think that I'm white, even though I certainly enjoy white privilege most of the time. Um, and I tell this personal story because that was something I was aware of when I was extremely young. And when I was five, we went to Greece and I wandered off from my family for a moment and some lady thought that I was lost and came up and was speaking Greek to me and seemed concerned. And then when I identified my family, her whole mannerisms towards me changed when she realized I was connected to the white people over there. And um, I remember very vaguely just being aware of that and kind of playing around with that as a kid, uh, playing around with how people perceived me. Um, and I certainly have never suffered for any of those perceptions. I wanna be clear about that. But um, yeah, I very much have appreciated the opportunity to be able to see it and experience it because I think it has shaped my understanding and my observance. And I have always been so thankful to have had that experience and thankful to have had that experience in safety because again, I, I really didn't experience anything horrible um, or terribly traumatizing because of that. Um, so I wanna read the other piece that we're speaking to as our students and as somebody who teaches this content a lot and somebody who's at 11th Street, I've certainly been approached by a lot of students and um, I think the most common concern and question that I have had from white students is, you know, what can I do? And I wanna read to you guys um, something. We have a class where we provide feedback to our students and at the end of feedback, I provided some students um, literally just before this, and I wanna share that with you guys. Um, it is, I, I share this with you as Sarah, really not as Dr. Wenger, and I also said that in class. So um, in this class, I sort of give them a challenge there uh, for what to do in their career. So my challenge was to tackle injustice when you see it. There are many versions of injustice, some we experience personally firsthand, or second hand by being with someone who's experiencing it or observing it, and others we can miss entirely. Please take an active role in monitoring your environments. To me, in my opinion, monitoring your professional environment is your duty. Monitoring your personal environment is your choice. Um, so monitor those environments for injustice and not merely address it when it is obvious to you like it is right now. Please specifically stand up to racism in this moment and moving forward. If we engage in evidence-based medicine, as we so strongly value, we must acknowledge health disparities based on race. Racism is active in the healthcare system and it causes morbidity and mortality among people of color. These things are very, very clear in the literature and the unknowns are how will we as a system address it? And I want to speak some specifics because if I'm going to give this charge to my students, I myself need to act on it and we need to act on it as a college. And I, I think there are some specific things we can do as a college to speak to what Rita was saying about structured opportunity looking at our scholarships, looking at our application process, looking at ClinEd. I, I really, I think 
it's wonderful to do. I'm so happy that we're doing this talk and I will be happier when we move forward and really provide our students with tangible changes and model what it is that we're talking about today. Thank you, Elder, so much. Um, Eileen Baer from um, the Vice President of Public Safety. I saw that you were on earlier. Is Eileen still with us? I'm still here. Excellent. I'm here. Eileen, would you like to share? Because I think a lot of students would be very, and faculty and staff would like to hear from the Chief of Police. So um, I didn't prepare a statement. For sure. Um, but that's okay because I asked Dr. Carey um, during a conversation with. I guess it was Monday, Dr. Carey, with yes. Kim Goldsting and, and several senior leadership members from diversity and Title IX. Um, I explained to them all that um, there's a lot of organizations on the campus. Um, and as the police department, I tried to get us invited and we're often not invited. Um, I asked and Dr. Carey jumped in a half a second when I said, I think the police officers need to be invited because we need to listen. So I think listening is so important for us and then listening how we can help you. I need to say that as a police chief, and I've been doing this for over 44 years now, um, I am, this is this last incident with George Floyd um, touched a spark for, for so many people, um, law enforcement, because we've been training on bias and race for decades, for decades. And we thought we were doing well and we haven't. As a chief, I'm um, ashamed. I am angry. Um, I am angry that nobody stepped up to stop all the officers. I, that really angers me. Um, there was a, four other officers there and nobody stopped this. That's, that's wrong. I mean. And, and whether it's a student or it's an officer teaching people to step up and you're all talking about that um, is something we have to do. And I think having our officers engage with you, being buddy to your conversations and you explaining to me and me listening how I can help you better this conversation. Um, reading your story is so powerful and I've listened to others and I always wish that officers could hear more of them. Um, and I ask the opportunities for everyone to share those stories with their officers. We do a lot of training um, and doing this for so long. I'm not sure our training is always good because I don't think we're asking the right people to help us train. And I am here to ask you to help us train our officers and how we can engage with you. So I'm, I'm here to ask, mm. to include us and to tell us what we should be doing. That's what I'm here to do today. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kerry, thank you so much. No, you're more than welcome. This has been probably one of the most phenomenal opportunities I've had in as many months or time here at Drexel to get the authentic presentations from everyone. Um, it's an ambitious hour. We even wanted to be able to respond to questions during this hour. I purposely made it an hour because I want people to want more of us, from us, you know, for us. Um, and we're already at the two minute mark before the time of close. But what I do want to do is summarize exactly, and I, was, I promised the team, the panelists, that I was um, gonna take copious notes as they were sharing, because I wanted people to hear some of the really, really important features that were brought up today. And this is not gonna be once and done. I feel like I'm gonna be Stella now, right? This is not, <laughs> this is not going to be once and done, absolutely not. Um, and it is not just my professional charge, but myself as a person, my work ethic, my approach to students learning, that this will not be a once and done. We have brought up so much today. We talked about the pathways to solutions. We talked about choices being important, police brutality, opening wounds of racism. I think Rita, Dr. Adenarin's illustration, if we had three or four or five days of all a panel of persons of color, everyone would have their stories of what transpired in their, in their lives. You know, as Rita's telling her story, I'm thinking about my story, I'm thinking about my sister's story, I'm thinking about my brother's stories. And unfortunately, persons of color have stories. So di thank you, Doc Dr. Denneran, for bringing up your uh, story. We have glaring evidences of injustice. We talked about that. 
uh, gaping disparities in healthcare quality and access, the pessimism of social change, although we also spoke about hope, thinking critically about race, should I be here? Am I, should I be presenting today? Journey to become aware of my privilege. Awareness is not an action that was shared today as a statement. We need anti-racist education. Uh, we are the change that, that we seek. And I totally believe that as well. Microaggressions in terms of how we're doing our part in the movement, but yet there's some microaggressions and macroaggressions that are still happening. I like the fact we talked about the morbidity and the mortality among persons of color in terms of our, our health care and our health disparities. Um, I think that Amanda had put up some of our resources that I had shared with her before. People can go back and listen to Dr. Kiara Bridges talking about reproducing race. Go back and listen to Dr. George Yancey, um, two of our distinguished presenters talking about the danger of whiteness. So we're not gonna be silent anymore. I want people to have these conversations in their classrooms. If faculty are hesitant, seek me out. I can give you some template type things to help engage or invite me to your class. I've done more and more guest lectures um, as of late and I want to actually do more. I feel like today was like a freedom forum, right? That we were getting some things off our chest. Our students heard from us. That was a goal of our, of our um, session today. And as Eileen said, as soon as she said who she was and that she's often not invited, I was like, oh no, she's coming. She's coming because students need to know that she wants to listen, she wants to learn. And we're gonna have another conversation, Eileen, now about how we can help you with that learning pathway. So I'm sure that we did have questions. This session is recorded. So I will take it as my personal um, um, expectation that I will reach out to those questions and make sure they're answered. It may be that they were addressed to some of you, so I will forward them to you. If people have been writing to me over the last couple of days, I've responded to each and every email that I have received. Whew, we did it. We did it. I'm not gonna say we're finished. I'm gonna say we started. I wanna thank everyone that was on today's call because you personally brought your authentic selves today. And I know that one of the hesitancies was to say I'm speaking for my department. No, you're representing yourself within that department. And I think students will be proud to know that someone in their department came forward and wanted to talk today. Maybe illustrative of others, maybe not. So I wanna thank you all for your time. Thank you all for your attention. I see the chat is kind of blowing up here. So um, I really appreciate each and every one of you. I believe there were over 230 of you. Um, that is absolutely phenomenal. This is not the last listening session. The next one, we're gonna start with questions. You may see a whole different panel, but can I just applaud everyone? If I have one of those little applaud meters, I should have thought about that. I wanna thank everyone for being on today. Everyone be safe and be healthy, especially during this pandemic as well. So there's a lot of layers to this and we're not finished talking about them. Have a great night.